I'm Seif van Rensheim. I trained as a designer, industrial design in, in Delft as well, and I never imagined myself being a professor and standing here in front of people. I never imagined myself to become a researcher and wearing a white coat, uh, doing stuff that other disciplines force me to do, like psychology or the hard sciences. But actually, I wanted to become a pro surfer. Um, so after my trips to France and Australia, I came back to the university and the people there convinced me that I could do research while using my design skills. So this is something that's called, back then, this was previous century, research to design. And I want to talk more specifically about the role of the prototype. So why prototyping in design? I think this is, well, it should be obvious to all of you. Uh, it's about exploring and evaluating ideas, mostly done within the small design team. It's also about communicating ideas to your external stakeholders. I think this is what Frauke already explained a bit more, and especially investigating user experiences and context through the act of designing, through building prototypes, more generative research, instead of looking back, looking towards the future and asking people about it. However, there's a bit of a distinction between research in business and research in academia, where I'm from. So this was in 93. Frailing talking about research into design, research for design, and what I would like to discuss is research through design, where the design process becomes the research process and the ar artifacts play an important role in generating knowledge. So timelines are different. A lot of research is done one and two years, and after talking with Frauke, I think for most UX this is one or two weeks. Um, there's research three to five, and what we're actually focusing on is that three to five or six to ten years research from now. So a lot of the thing that she did was already, she did herself in her PhD before, and other people before that. So a lot of research being done in academia within universities comes common good in six to ten years. So what I'm going to show now, you will see in six to ten years. This book is already out, so this is now, so you can read it. It's a design research through practice. Um, it looked at research through design around the world, and especially research that imagines and builds new things and describes and explains these constructions. So where most research either looks back to previous case studies or current phenomena, this is looking forward, looking research into the future, designing something for the future, and then how, see, how people deal with it and make sense of it. So the book is based on three observations. So especially first author, Ilpo Koskina from Finland, who's looking around and see what were people doing best practice. There are hundreds of methods, but only a few methodologies. So every organization, every company, every designer has their own set of methods, but few overarching methodologies. So he looked at what best practice is doing, and then two criteria, the research needs to be integrated. And this means integration with theory, theoretical thinking combined with practice design work. Second is research programs has to be successful. So there's a bit of a following and a community behind it. And then he found three methodologies, lab, where you do controlled design experiments in the laboratory. Field, contextualizing design and putting it actually into the field and see what's happening. And showroom, which builds more on art and asking questions and puts design on display. So these are three examples from the lab approach. So this was my own work. Uh, for a long time, I have been known as the alarm clock guy. Um, and this is the reason why. Uh, 
Um, this was in the time where they talked about uh, this was effective computing. So what if computers could take a person's emotion into account? Could it be become more intelligent? And this was the typical MIT way, uh, putting sensors on people's body and then measuring biosensing uh, information and then try to get the emotion out of it. And I thought, this is not how a designer would do it, especially maybe not an interaction designer, because the way we interact with the world, we express our emotions. And I thought, like, is it possible to design a device as such that you can express your emotions in it? And of course, this is a bit far-fetched, but then we made an experiment to show the hypothesis. So the hypothesis was this specific designed alarm clock can recognize the effective state of the user and the level of urgency from the way the user sets the alarm. So this was within a university, and the only proper way to do research was through hardcore statistics and do a psychological experiment where you have a, this controlled setting. So I, to put people into effective states, I had four different movie clips. So this was positive, smiling, high arousal, to put people into a happy, pleasant mood. That was a pleasant but low arousal. I picked up my bag. A scene from Easy Rider. This was a Russian movie. And this went on for two and a half minutes. And this is a scene from Kayana Skatsi, and especially the fit of glass music makes people very annoying, at least me, having to go through so many experiments. So this was a very structured way, putting people into emotion, and then see how they set the alarm clock. So this was one person setting eight different times, four movies times two different uh, uh, urgency levels, to demonstrate that people actually, what they felt, was expressed in the way they were setting. So I looked at all the different actions, not the final state, but all the actions in between, where people expressed themselves. And we saw a relationship between people making aesthetically pleasing patterns, so a lot of symmetry when they were feeling good. When they were feeling more distressed, these were shorter, faster actions resulting in more asymmetrical patterns. So we demonstrated a causal relationship between the effective state of the user and the way the user sets the alarm. Next to that, it also provided design notions. So this is when we introduced freedom of interaction, especially the notion of feed forward, because Donald Norman already pointed us to feedback, and we actually demonstrated and showed that feed forward is more informing than feedback. Also interaction frogger, and then a strong relationship to theory on ecological perception and phenomenology. Then there are examples, more coming from the Scandinavian participatory approach, where there was a field approach. So they said, why do research in a lab, put it in the field? The context of a natural setting, design ethnography, and more driven by understanding a situation than collecting data. Then this was at that point more the UK version. This was more design and arts, where research meets design and art. And it's not so much about generating knowledge, but, but generating debate. What if design takes a detour? Where does it end up? And what do people think about that? So in, usually these are things that is done in art, but they use design because this is closer to reality. A museum is something where you go and then leave again, but design is coming into your house. And what does that mean? The second observation was thinking and design. And this is the designs on the outer side the philosophies in the center, and designers should stay away from those philosophies. Some of the theory, but the actual most interesting thing for designers is, are these frameworks, because these frameworks bridge theory and the actual design. And this is the real knowledge that is generated that is purposeful for beyond the local context, but also for other projects. And the third thing was design things in research. So the importance of the actual artifact, the thing, in doing the research. And this is what I would like to focus on a bit more. This is a chapter that we wrote in a book. It's way too expensive. But you can find my own version online. Yeah, I'm disappointed. Sorry. <laughs> so the aim was to see how other designers use 
design things in generating knowledge, and also to identify possibilities for other design research to generate knowledge through their prototypes. And we identified four roles. The prototype as an experimental component, the prototype as a means of inquiry, prototype as a research archetype, and the activity of prototyping as a vehicle for inquiry. This is the work of uh, my colleague, Joop Frens, who is more looking into uh, uh, coming from ecological psychology, the notion of affordances and rich, meaningful actions. And he thought, is it possible to design a camera where your actions are meaningful? So this was when analog went digital, and you had all these buttons and menu structures where people imported things that work in a computer and put it in a normal product like a camera. So here he, so this was what was currently, the conventional was on the market, and he came up with rich actions. So he made two intermediate steps in between. So he had a structured four prototypes in order to test the differences on pragmatic and hedonic qualities. Again, a lot of statistic, statistics showing that there was beauty in interaction in especially the rich actions camera. But also still ease of use for a significant portion of the people and the notion of goodness as an in-between thing. Demonstrating that yes, there's value in rich action cameras instead of staying with the traditional menu structured product products. This is the research of Philip Ross, and he was looking into this, we, to further this notion of aesthetics of interaction. So instead of aesthetics of form, which we understand as designers, but what about, inter so you had these nice looking products, but the interaction was horrible. So instead of focusing on the usability aspect and making the product easier to use, we thought might be a way that the beauty of use can help people to actually find interest and function. So he designed a lamp with different types of behaviors. And here I'm showing two. So on the left side, a behavior that would elicit social power in the user. So the user feels socially powerful. In the other light, he was trying to establish helpfulness as a relationship between aesthetics and ethics. So the direct coupling between his actions, or the more indirect coupling on the other side, shows that people actually felt more helpful towards their device or felt socially powerful when interacting with the other one. So here, the prototype is in a way a hypothesis of, yes, it is possible to make a connection between ethical values of people and aesthetics of interaction. So this generated, next to a light, also new design knowledge on aesthetics of interaction. It also came up with a methodological contribution, a design approach for dealing with aesthetics of interaction. And here it had a relationship to theory on pragmatist aesthetics and ethics. It also provided a startup. Of course, here you can question the aesthetic choices that the marketeers were taking in order to sell the product to a, a larger audience, but this is the difference between academic research and commercial research. So the prototype was used as a physical hypothesis that could be tested in a controlled experiment. It's either the thing itself or it's a combination of the thing in use and different uh, in, in my case, with the alarm clock, different uh, uh, emotional settings. So the design of the experiment is equally crucial. 
So that's this specific part. And you read the paper, you can see a bit more on, on what it actually means, those different roles. The second one is the prototype as a means of inquiry. And this is similar to, for example, a thermometer. I mean, you use the thermometer to measure a phenomenon elsewhere. So you use the design, and this was my own cultural probe as research for the experience of waking up, a little package that you put into the context where people collect rich information from different angles in different media and give that back to the researcher. So the prototype is a means of inquiry into another phenomenon. This is a more recent example, and this is from uh, Angela McKay, um, researcher within uh, our university, on designing and wearing dynamic fabric. This is in relationship of smart textiles, wearables, where you can wear a digital fabric. And instead of focusing and making the technology work in order for that to happen, that is what other people are good at, she was speculating and was using a green screen dress as a way to. Together with a smartphone application that could uh, change the green into a different pattern. In order to see what it would mean to wear digital fabrics in everyday life. And what she did was explore this by actually wearing it. Also had to do with the assumption that if you could change your garment, the pattern of your garment, instantly and often, you would probably buy less clothes. So this was the assumption about sustainability, that if you have one garment and you could change how it looks, that you would buy less. So what she did was wear a green dress for eight weeks. And at a certain point she realized, okay, this is not working. I need to have more dresses, more variations of the green. Over the course of 10 months, she started. Experimenting with different green elements in her physical outfits and then playing with first static content, then dynamic content, and actually generating wardrobes of digital content for herself. So one, I mean, there was a problematic assumption that you would wear less clothes. So this is, I don't know when, I think a bit further into, that she was actually having a whole physical wardrobe of green clothes, but also a digital wardrobe and virtual closets. Things she could wear online when she felt like it. So this is her uh, Instagram where she had this whole closet of different patterns that she could wear when she felt like wearing this. And this was not only about expressing herself to her online audience, this was also trying things out in her own little intimate domain with her phone, the dress, and these different patterns. So clothing yourself, suddenly the whole digital aspect became far more intimate in the same intimacy that she would deal with when she was talking about physical clothes and garments. She also came with a notion of digital blending. So wearing patterns, because she could do it on the spot, take a picture of a background, and then paste that background into her own dress. She also felt that if I could do it, other people could do it too. So she was digitally attacked by a colleague that was taking pictures of her using the same chroma key 
notion and then just facing these things on her and posting these pictures online, which of course she didn't appreciate. But this is what could happen if with this new technology. So here, prototype as a means of inquiry into a digital future of wearing. So nothing specific is being tested as such, but it's more sent out as an open-ended exploration of something we don't know yet. It's designed as an intervention and then study the consequences. And rich data comes back from all these issues, the Instagram, the, uh, the Instagram part, the interviews with herself, the interviews with people around her. So that's that second role, means of inquiry. The third is a research archetype, where the prototype is a physical embodiment of a concept of an understanding or a design space. It's a clear example within the research contribution. So this should be known to a lot of people on tangible interaction, the marble answering machine, as a way of physicalizing digital content, digital messages on an answering machine. This is from uh, the back then RCA, Tony Dunn on Design Noir, archetypes to both in its form and the way it was presented, a more dystopian future of what technology could do when people are afraid of all the radiation and all the Wi-Fi around them and want to hide from that. So here, design, and this was his notion of design noir, and design is about Hollywood, and this design is a bit about film noir and more, more the obscure parts of where design could be. Perhaps a less dystopian example. This is an example where after lunch, Christy will uh, tell you much more about. But this was her textiles as a research archetype of a new type of product. So she also took the perspective of craft qualities and as a view on smart textile services. So using craft, which we know from analog old products, and use those qualities for future projects of smart textile services. where she made a comparison between Estonian dress and the different patterns that inspired her, which eventually, and she'll probably explain a bit more, into storytelling and crafting aspects of a physical garment with a digital technology and the whole service around it. And I put the picture in it because it's me and my little two boys there. That's not enough. It's not just the product, uh, product or the prototype. It's then a critical analysis of the prototype in relationship to what experts say about the craft qualities of the Muhu skirt, as well as the smart technology. So it's an, an, a critical look at the thing through craft qualities. So here, the prototype is an archetype next to a critical analysis of this archetype in light of uh, theory. And so the design knowledge is that it created a new class of products, smart textile services. It's about new design notions, these craft qualities, but also the analytic framework to analyze and perhaps generate new textile services and the relation th to theory. And here again, also, although this is research from academia, it's also ended up in a, in a startup. So still research that's done within a university has commercial, can have commercial value. The fourth role is prototyping as a vehicle for inquiry. So this is the act of prototyping as an object of research, but also a driver of research. So this is the work of uh, Willem Horst, um, who was an interaction designer and a researcher within Danfoss, the company that makes uh, uh, thermostats, a Danish company. And usually interaction design is done by the interaction designer. And he or she makes the, the decisions. Whereas the rest of the department is not involved in those decisions because they don't have the skills. He then made up this live prototyping session. 
So he was making life adjustments in the interaction while marketeers, engineers, service provider or service uh, uh, the guy, the, the mechan mechanic uh, uh, parts were all there making suggestions on the design that was on screen. He implemented them and then people say, okay, yes, now I understand it doesn't work. Or people could comment on, yes, but in my line of job, this is not working. So suddenly, the prototyping of the interaction design was done as a collaborative effort. That was then made a virtual prototype, and I think it became an award-winning uh, product. So here, the prototyping process is both the method and the object of the research. Prototyping in the work of uh, Christy, where well, we're showing one of the final stages, but there are a lot of stages in between. And each stage, in a way, and the whole string of st st uh, uh, prototypes is a vehicle into the inquiry. The inquiry, on the one hand, into sustainability qualities, and in the other hand, on craft qualities. And this is not a nice linear process. And here, in her thesis, she shows how the detours are being taken in prototyping in relationship between design and research. The discussion part, research through design is not a singular method or approach, and the roles can be separated but also overlap. And although I presented it as one, two, three, four, where one is the most accepted and, uh, way of doing research with hard statistics, and prototyping is not so much seen as research, it's often the other way around. I mean, starting with prototyping, leading to a cardboard archetype, and then leading to a final experiment. One prototype also can play different roles. Um, here, as part of an experiment, but also as inquiry into collaboration. Um, but they react on senses. So in that sense, I think it's beautiful that we want to make a product for that and that we think about not only the patients, but also the people who are really close to the patients. For me, it's important as physiotherapists that people move and they move their arms or move their shoulders to get stimulated because also that's important for the nurses to get dressed, to stimulate that if they do this or do that. It's important for the muscles, but also for the brain, to stimulate the brain. That's important for people with dementia. Op die matextals hebben we dus samenwerking met jullie studenten en andere partners. Hier de prototype kwaliteit ontwikkeld. Is also an inquiry into the collaboration between technology, design, production, therapists, elderly people with dementia, their partners. The prototype is in a way the means through which this collaboration is investigated. Can have real societal value. And it's interesting and that here the hardcore the engineer is talking about societal value. And people borrow like, like each other's language in order to create value. It's also a new class of product, so it's an archetype of a product service system, where it's not just a product, but also the whole service around it, where here are videos are being taken, and here the partner of the, uh, the, the lady there is watching these videos together with the therapist as part of the product service system. Because these video videos, through these videos, she can explain how her condition is actually improving with the use of the product. So in conclusion, presented three programs, lab, field, and showroom, broadly identified four roles of prototypes in design research, where all have potential to cont contribute to research inquiry, and diversity is something that needs to be celebrated, and I think we're going to celebrate it further on today. So, thank you. <laughs>